In the late summer of 2003, I was driving home to my duplex in Lubbock, Texas. At the time, I was a rapper. <laughs> a young, white rapper. A 19-year-old definitely didn't think it was a phase when I was a young, white rapper. Which meant I made songs and did shows and drove around blaring hip-hop and smoking weed, usually blunts. It wasn't until I was an adult that I realized how truly insufferable I must have been. <laughs> Especially given who and where I was. I took all the negative looks and shaking heads as reinforcement that my attempts at teenage rebellion were working. So what happened that day was very unexpected. I was speeding through an intersection when a couple younger black guys crossed the street right in front of my car. I had to slam on my brakes. We all looked at each other ready to lose it. But then something amazing happened. Everyone noticed the blunts. <laughs> Plural. They were right in the middle of passing their blunt and mine was still hanging from my lips. Everything clicked. It was like that movie moment when like time slows down and a beautiful song swells reuniting two star-crossed lovers. Except this was a dusty residential road in West Texas and the beautiful song was by the Wu-Tang Clan and the lovers were me and two complete strangers who also happened to smoke weed. No one said anything, just the apprehensive exchange of quick head nods, you know. Like they got closer to my car. We all shook hands. I asked if they needed a ride. They did. <laughs> it was destiny. <laughs> Cue the fucking doves. And then we were driving. They complimented my song choice. I complimented their taste. I hit their weed. They tried mine. They gave me directions. And as I followed them, the guy in the front seat asked, what do you know about hip hop? I said, I love hip hop. And then after noticing I'd been reciting every word to every song under my breath, the guy in the back seat asked, do you rap? I was like, maybe. <laughs> so coy. And then we were rapping together, first loudly over the music that was already on, but that never really worked because you're kind of competing with whoever's on the song. So I put in a CD of beats that I'd made. And once I told them I was also a producer, they were even more interested. I talked about the little studio I'd built in my room and the group I was in and the shows we'd done. And then I asked them if they were busy. They said no. So I hit a dramatic U-turn and headed home. When we got there, my dog West, a giant two-year-old black lab, greeted us at the front door, turning one of my new friends into a terrified little kid. He told me he was scared of big dogs, which I understood. Wes was harmless, but he was a huge, full-grown puppy who liked to jump up and hug and was probably pretty scary if that's not your thing. Wes loved the backyard, so it wasn't a big deal. I let him out. He used all of his energy to frolic through the grass, and then the guys and I went into my room to smoke more of ours. I could do this blunt rolling thing where I opened the cigar with just the thumbs instead of like a tool or a razor blade. It was kind of my move. <laughs> but they were more interested in checking out my music equipment and setup, which was fair. We combined stashes and rolled a fat blunt that we smoked as we rapped over all the new beats I excitedly showed them. It was great. I'd only lived in Lubbock for a little bit, and while I'd made some friends, it was a time in my life when I was always open to more, especially ones who were into the same things as me, and in Lubbock, Texas, in 2003, that was absolutely rare. A good hour went by before I became very aware that I hadn't been around my dog in a while. Wes and I were pretty inseparable. I'd saved up all my day job money the summer I moved out of my parents' house to go to California and West was the first thing I bought. I raised him and trained him for two years as we moved around the country before ending up in Lubbock a couple hours away from my hometown. 
From city to city, Wes was always there, and he was everything I ever wanted in a dog. He was insanely smart and loyal and had the best personality. When I went to buy a dog, I had to choose out of a big group of puppies, which wasn't hard because this perfect little black lab came right up to me and pawed at my hand. My friend who was with me goes, hey, man, he's trying to dap you up right now. <laughs> Secret handshake stuff, you know. It was love at first sight that never went away. So the sensation of being home without him right at my side was weird. But I was high and happy and probably pretty manic, and I just spaced. So I rushed out to check on him. But he was gone. The gate was open. I must have been in such a flurry of weed and excitement when I got home that I'd forgotten to check. The guilt was suffocating. Everything changed, like a car crash. Nothing you were doing matters, and it all happens before you can even catch your breath. I just started to panic. He was the first thing in my life I'd ever been responsible for, and I loved him so much. Years of going through everything together had created an incredible bond, but he was gone. I ran through the open gate out to the front, screaming his name as I scanned up and down the street. I went to search, but remembered there were two strangers alone in my house. So I hurried back to my room, told them what happened. They understood. We said a quick goodbye. I didn't get their names or numbers, and I never saw them again. I immediately broke into a dead sprint toward the park down the street. Wes and I walked there almost every day, and I knew that had to be the first place he'd go. But I had no idea how long he'd been gone. He could have gotten out within minutes of being put in the backyard, which was almost an hour ago. As I approached the park, horrified and full of this unfamiliar and profound anxiety, I saw a blur of black, white, red and blue and it was maybe the first time in my young life that I'd ever been happy to see a cop car. This feeling quickly equalized when I felt the long burned out blunt roach from earlier still between my fingers. <laughs> I'd been so overwhelmed with guilt and fear that I'd just been clutching it the entire time. I threw it as far away as I could and prayed the police didn't see me do it. But I didn't stop moving toward the car. Losing a pet is a nightmare. And my brain was starting to fill my head with all the horrible things that could happen to him. So I was absolutely willing to risk going to jail if it meant finding West. The officer seemed appropriately confused at the sight of a manic, clearly high, out of breath teenager asking them for help. And a lost dog was a bit under their pay grade. <laughs> They said they'd do what they could, which I assumed was nothing, and the only thing that happened as a result of talking to them was allowing Wes to get even further away from home and safety. The neighborhood became massive. Every street was its own city. I didn't know which way to go, but I just ran and yelled. The dread was turning into this brutal, forced acceptance that he could be gone forever. The sweat and tears burned my eyes as I called all the local shelters and pounds and talked to several operators who hadn't received any reports about a black lab. He was so friendly and curious. He just wanted to meet people and play. He could cover a lot of ground easily before realizing he was lost. And as smart as he was, he got distracted easily. And my biggest fear was that a smell or a new person or another animal was too enticing to ignore. And there was a busy street with cars. And No, I told myself, he's fine. He's fine. I'm going to find him no matter what. He'll be OK. After talking to everyone I possibly could, every shelter, every animal control person in the city, and getting no good news, all I could do was keep looking. Call back, keep looking, call back, keep looking. An hour went by and I'd been running and yelling for so long I could barely see straight and was losing my voice. Call back. They found a lab, but he's not black. Keep looking. My legs were cramping, so I went to get my car. The adrenaline and the fear were making me sick, and I knew the only way to feel better was to find him. My brain took a break from pummeling me with horrific images to do something equally as painful. I started to think of memories from when he was a puppy. 
like when he somehow got into the laundry room where I kept his food and I caught him laying in a pile of it, somehow fitting more into his already engorged stomach. I fed him the bare minimum for two days and he shit constantly. <laughs> Coming back from the memories was like whiplash, but I forced myself to keep looking up and down every street, hoping that one of the black blurs I saw in the distance would be him, but they weren't. He was so fast, he could have been anywhere. When he was a little bigger than a puppy, I started taking him on long walks all over our neighborhood in San Diego, where he's from. I would longboard and he'd sprint as fast as he could and sometimes I would intentionally go ahead of him so I could wait for him to catch up. When he finally caught me, he would jump up and tackle me and lick my face and it was the fucking best. But then I shot back to the present again as another hour passed with no luck. The sun was starting to set. When I moved back to Texas, Wes and I were so close and he was so well trained, I would just take him all over the city without a leash. He was still a puppy, but he never disobeyed. Maybe this was his attempt at teenage rebellion. And this thought was almost comforting for a minute before I realized it didn't change the fact that the world wouldn't stop for him. He was in danger and it was my fault. I'd been looking so hard for so long, I was starting to get dizzy and disoriented, but I had to pull over. I used the time to call back all the numbers, and after a few more no's and dead ends, an animal control person finally said someone had found a lab, a black one this time, but in a completely different area of the city. And that the people who found it had to leave their house, so they just put the dog in their backyard. She gave me the address and I drove over as fast as I could. And it was a good thing I got in my car because the place was so far away, I wouldn't have had the energy to get there on foot. This was a bad sign, but it was all I had. I pulled up, slammed on my brakes for the second time that day and flew out of my car over the fence. I leapt up onto it and before my head was even looking over the post, West was jumping up against it on the other side. I launched myself into this stranger's backyard and then I tackled him and licked his face. <laughs> I wish he could have told me about all of his adventures, you know, but I was more than happy to just lay there with him. So grateful, so relieved, and so unbelievably lucky. It was like that movie moment when time slows down and a beautiful song swells reuniting a boy and his dog. Thank you. And uh, real quick, after 16 amazing years, and while I was writing this story, Wes passed away. This is for him and for my parents who took care of him when I couldn't. Thank you very much.